All right, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the latest installment of ENO's Road to Recovery webinar series. I'm Catherine Idzorek, the 2020 Thomas J. O'Brien Fellow at ENO. I am also a PhD candidate in urban design and planning at the University of Washington, where I study social networks and community scale disaster resilience. Today, I'm looking forward to a discussion about ongoing research and efforts to address evacuations from disasters and emergencies amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's presentation will provide summaries of critical transportation, sheltering, logistic, and communication challenges, as well as possible strategies for evacuating large populations from danger. In addition, the session will include case studies of recent disasters and broader research directions related to evacuations and resilience to address the ongoing and worsening climate crisis. Joining us today is Stephen Wong, a doctoral candidate studying transportation engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Stephen's research focuses on the intersection of evacuations, decision-making, and shared mobility. He is an affiliate with the Institute of Transportation Studies and the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at UC Berkeley, and he is a former ENO fellow. Just a quick administrative note, while Stephen is presenting, you can submit your questions using the questions function at any time. And after the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A, and you can, of course, continue to submit questions then. We'll try to get to as many of the audience questions as we can, and today's presentation will also be made available on Eno's website. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction, and thank you for, uh, to Eno for allowing me to present on this work. Uh, I'm excited to be uh, presenting this preliminary work, and it is an, in some ways an untimely uh, presentation given the current crisis in California. Um, we're actually still seeing the smoke uh, here and the wildfires are still raging. Uh, so a little bit about uh, this research and this research uh, team. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Wong. I'm a doctoral candidate at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm doing this research alongside Jacqueline Broder, who is a staff researcher at the Transportation Sustainability Research Center, as well as Dr. Susan Shaheen, who is a professor at UC Berkeley and the PI on this project. Uh, both uh, Susan Shaheen and I also represent the University of California Institute of Transportation Studies and the California Resilient and Innovative Mobility Initiative. So just giving you a little bit of background. So the outline of my presentation today, I'm gonna to first talk about evacuations in terms of the background. I'll then go into our preliminary research methodology and then straight into results, where I'll be talking about the primary strategies that experts uh, through a series of interviews identified as being strategies that need to occur in the next one to two months. I'll also briefly talk about the case study of the 2020 California wildfires, and then go into next steps and go through a Q&A process. All right, so a little bit of background of what I'll be talking about today. So large-scale evacuations are one of the primary methods to safeguard human life. And we've seen this on a number of different natural disasters as well as human-made disasters, such as millions of people ordered to evacuate from Hurricanes Irma, Florence, and Dorian. 1.1 million people ordered to evacuate from the California wildfires, but also some that were a little bit more man-made or a result of natural hazards leading to a potential crisis, such as the Oroville Dam crisis that led to 180,000 people being ordered to evacuate and a chemical plant explosion in Texas that led to 50,000 people being ordered. This is not a complete list by any means, uh, but the worrisome part is that we are currently in both wildfire and hurricane season and we are seeing higher intensity and frequency of rainfall, heat waves, and wildfires due to climate change. We're also seeing increasing land development and populations in high-risk areas, which will really all point towards the future where we'll see more frequent and larger evacuations due to these events. And, on, and these, there's a lot of questions in terms of how to solve this evacuation cha these challenges. Uh, in my research, I've identified three critical ones. The first one is compliance, uh, which is persistent non-compliance to uh, mandatory evacuation orders. In many cases, people decide to stay, uh, especially in hurricanes, uh, but also in wildfires as people try to defend their homes. And this can pre present uh, a lot of safety issues, especially for first responders as they try to find out who has evacuated and who hasn't. In 
some cases, people are just physically unable to comply with evacuation orders or don't have the economic resources. The second challenge is congestion, which is poor transportation response leading to heavy congestion, slow evacuation clearance times, and high evacuee risk. This is really focused on transportation agencies, which have typically taken a back seat when it comes to evacuations in disasters until really recently. And so there's been a growing movement to start to incorporate transportation transit agencies in emergency evacuation plans. And finally, the uh, critical challenge is social equity. And there's really been minimal attention in ensuring all populations, especially those most vulnerable, have transportation shelter. So if you remember one thing from this webinar in terms of the critical challenges that we face are compliance, congestion, and social equity. Layered on top of these challenges is COVID-19. And the new challenges are about minimizing the spread of COVID-19, but also specifically to disasters is communicating COVID-19 risk to evacuees, notifying evacuees of these new plans and procedures, and also trying to reduce staying behavior as people are worried about uh, catching COVID-19 during their evacuation process. So there's a lot of concerns that, that arise from COVID-19 that need to be considered now in our disaster management plan. This is also complicated by the fact that a number of key evacuation strategies, um, many of which specifically help individuals with disabilities and other vulnerable populations, require people to be in close contact with each other. That includes public transit, shared mobility, congregate public shelters, friends and family assistance, and also volunteering and recovery assistance. So these strategies need now have to be reworked in order to make them more feasible in a COVID-19 world. This leads us to our primary problem that we want to address in our research. The problem is, is that stay-at-home orders and social and physical distancing, distancing to address COVID-19 directly conflict with evacuation orders that typically rely upon high-capacity vehicles and shelters to protect people in disasters. The second part to this problem is that disasters could significantly exacerbate the spread of COVID-19 due to the movement and close contact of evacuees, first responders, and volunteers. So to tackle this problem, we set out uh, to first actually write a blog, uh, because it was very early on in the COVID-19 process, uh, during COVID-19, and uh, we, we produced this in May. It was a Medium article. It's a quick five-minute read if you're interested. But we wanted to give just six key areas and considerations that transportation and emergency management agencies should make when uh, thinking about uh, evacuating individuals in a disaster. This led to a rapid response grant from the University of California Institute of Transportation Studies, which is, I wanna note, is a part of a wider COVID-19 response effort uh, that includes 17 different research projects at UCITS across the four campuses, which is Berkeley, Davis, Irvine, and UCLA. Most recently, uh, there was an article that was actually released uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, and this is a preprint on compound risks of hurricane evacuation amid the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And the research found that both the origin and the destination county of evacuees really determines the level of spread of COVID-19. This does present a problem, though, because uh, in hurricane evacuations, many people end up going to far-flung counties for fr friends and family assistance. And so they could, for example, catch COVID in that destination or also bring it back to their origin county. So the research methodology, the first phase is a needs and strategy assessment. Uh, and this is really what I'll be presenting today. We interviewed 17 high-ranking California experts on the critical challenges for evacuations in a COVID-19 world. We asked about current preparedness efforts going on at different agencies, as well as preliminary strategies that they saw as being key to addressing the intersectionality of these two uh, competing uh, crises. Phase two is a case study analysis. We'll be focusing mostly on disasters during the lockdown or shutdown period, uh, but we'll also be gaining additional insights from more recent disasters, including the, the current wildfires and also Hurricane Laura that will be making landfall sometime soon uh, in, in Texas. Um, the last phase, which uh, is kind of uh, an extra piece to this research, is looking at a public safety power shutoff analysis. For those of you who may not know, uh, PSPS events, are deliberate shutdowns of power lines uh, and power systems to protect uh, from wildfire risk because electrical systems are often causes of wildfires, particularly in California. Uh, we have a data set from last year from October, 
and our goal is to assess behavior and influencers on choice, and we hope to glean something from this when we think about a PSPS event, a wildfire, and COVID-19 all at the same time. So our California experts, we conducted 16 interviews with 17 experts. One of them was, uh, one of the interviews was with two experts, uh, where we had 13 organizations represented uh, from a wide variety of different agencies and areas, uh, as well as both state, local, and regional levels across the state. We've tried to get a nice variety of, of experts. Uh, 12 of our interviewees were at the executive director or chief levels uh, of their organizations. And so we really wanted to focus on people who will be calling the shots uh, in these disasters. The audience for this work uh, is actually bit quite varied. Uh, for most of you probably on the call, the focus is going to be on the transportation aspect. But all these areas, strategy areas, are interconnected with each other. We have agencies in the middle and emergency support functions on the right. Uh, and the transportation ones are probably the most interesting. But I do want to note that for access and functional needs, multi-jurisdictional and emergency management strategies, all agencies involved with disasters should be paying attention to these strategies, including, and that includes all of the ESF in that. In terms of strategies, uh, I had mentioned before that we are focusing on the primary strategies in this uh, webinar series and also in a uh, to be published policy brief that will be coming out in probably a couple of weeks from now. Uh, we focus on these primary strategies because they must be implemented within one to two months and have to be thought of very quickly in order to address the current disaster season. Uh, the secondary strategies, which will be in future reports, will be implemented three to six months, and then tertiary will be, can be implemented next disaster season. So we wanted to create a priority list and make it very actionable for agencies to look at and, be, and say, this is what we need, we have a check for this, and, uh, and go through that process. All right, jumping into the preliminary results. Uh, so these results are really a, a compilation of the, of the expert interviews uh, an analysis of what the uh, interviewees uh, said. Now, I do want to note that these are the ones that were most mentioned by experts. It does not mean that all of them were mentioned by all experts, but that these were primary concerns of many different uh, experts and even across different types of agencies. So I just want to make that clear that uh, we didn't specifically ask people, should people wear masks or should people socially distance on vehicles? Uh, we left that as an open question. We just merely asked what are key challenges you see and what are key strategies you also see and preparedness efforts going on. So for public transit evacuation strategies, I do want to note that one of the key opportunities here is to, is to design more comprehensive safety protocols and leverage adaptability and flexibility of right-sized vehicles, particularly for providing transit and paratransit uh, for Carlos households, people with disabilities, and other access and functional needs populations. Some of the aspects that experts uh, talked about are things that are already being implemented on public transit systems right now, which is requiring masks and social distancing on vehicles, increasing sanitization frequency, and also ensuring transportation workforce has access to PPE and other key supplies. But they wanted to specifically note the PPE aspect for um, for evacuations because it could be the, the determinant whether a driver will actually show up to assist in an evacuation. For evacuation planning strategies, the key opportunity here is to reframe evacuation transportation as a right. Uh, so the first is create and bolster policies and encourage residents to leave early and quickly. This is not a new idea and many, actually many of these strategies are not new and not necessarily specifically informed by the COVID-19 crisis. But the fact that they keep coming up really shows that there's still these strategies that need to be implemented. And there are most likely many transportation and emergency management agencies, as well as social service agencies, that are not necessarily thinking about these different strategies. The second is to ensure workforce has training and ability to perform disaster tasks at home, which is new because of COVID-19 and telework, uh, and still in the field, such as traffic operations. There was some notes on leveraging changeable message signs and traveler information to help people in the events related to public health disasters and PSPS events. Many times these changeable message signs are used for denoting how many minutes it takes to get from one place to another, but in this case can actually be used uh, for saying that uh, there is um, a, a mandate for masks across the state, as well as places where it might be dangerous to go in terms of a disaster. Finally, to develop and strengthen statewide and regional transportation plans and mutual aid agreements that can pool resources 
specifically from non-impacted COVID-19 and disaster areas. In, in many of these disasters, they impact a large area, but there are most likely counties and other areas, including other states, that may have access to resources that are not being as impacted by COVID-19. So that was a, a new strategy that was uh, considered. Most of the discussion about COVID-19 and evacuations has been about sheltering strategies, specifically congregate sheltering. There is a key opportunity here to improve accessibility, safety, and health in public shelters for the long term. This doesn't have to just be in this specific time frame. Uh, but there are ones, uh, strategies here that need to be implemented as soon as possible, and many of them are being, which is, which is a good sign. Uh, set up partitions around beds, space beds apart, and create isolated rooms. Also creating a quarantine space for COVID-19 positive evacuees. There is also needs to be assurances that volunteers are properly trained for a COVID-19 environment and given adequate PPE. This was specifically brought in the, up in the context that volunteers may be uncomfortable uh, assisting in a shelter, especially since many volunteers are retired and they may worry COVID-19 exposure. Require masks inside of shelters, increase cleaning procedures, and even rework filtration systems were all additional strategies. And unfortunately, the days of buffet lines are gone in shelters uh, where now we have to reduce sharing of resources and food for free packaged food, for example. Uh, there was also uh, a couple strategies on pre-shelter screening and also bolstering and creating functional assessment service teams, also known as staff, to assist people with disabilities, such as uh, translators or interpreters or people who can provide additional medical services uh, or even mental health care. There was also a shift in thinking, and this is actually a really interesting uh, development, is that there's a key opportunity to rethink mass care as more personalized, comfortable, and equitable shelter. And this was kind of wrapped around the idea of non-congregate shelters and trying to space people apart, which actually could lead to improved uh, comfort. Uh, experts specifically noted that, that agencies need to pre-plan partnerships with alternative sheltering options, including hotels, motels, fairgrounds, college dorm stadiums, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing, such as Airbnb. But a specific emphasis was placed on those non-congregate shelters for smaller events, and specifically for individuals with access and functional needs, to reduce COVID-19 exposure to that specific group. Uh, another key aspect is to ensure that the first floor of motels and all accessible rooms are provided only to people with disabilities and those with mobility challenges. That is something that is often lost in the chaos of a disaster, but needs to be worked into plans to begin with. For recovery and relief and logistics, the key opportunity is to build out infrastructure partnerships and storage for rapid relief. One aspect is to increase stockpiles of critical supplies, especially PPE, and identify storage facilities. This has been an ongoing strategy in many locations in the South and Gulf Coast for hurricanes, but has not really been uh, a, a, a strategy for California or for wildfires. But given the need and the size of these wildfires, this was on top of mind for a lot of people. They also recommended to revisit contracts with large suppliers uh, for larger equipment, such as trailers or washing stations, and also to revisit contracts with truck companies to ensure they can still be fulfilled. This can be just as easy as picking up a phone and making sure that the supply chain network is still good to go and that these contracts can still be fulfilled. Finally, uh, what the strategy that was mentioned was to create mechanisms and specifically a lead agency for bulk ordering and partnerships for state-to-state -state aid, county-to-county -county aid, via memorandums of understanding, and mutual aid agreements. This was uh, really important that a specific agency was in charge of bulk ordering, uh, such that it could be streamlined and much more efficient. For public communications, uh, the opportunity is to use existing communication tactics and lessons learned during COVID-19 for emergency management. And one aspect of this is to identify and leverage emer emerging information providers that are trusted during COVID-19, such as governors or mayors or elected officials or public health officers who already are trusted within the community. The next was to, and this was across all, all nearly all experts, was to develop clear and direct messaging and communication with the use of visual aids, graphics, delivery of information in multiple languages and accessibility formats. This sounds like a very basic strategy, and it is, but it's very hard to implement on the ground, and it's still being an issue, even during the current 2020 August California wildfires. 
uh, communicate truth for frequent messages was another strategy, and also work closely with transportation, emergency management, and disability experts with diverse knowledge in the field to craft messages. This can come through, especially with many of you on the call that are from transportation agencies, and making sure that there is a liaison and someone in the transportation agency who has experience and background in disasters, who is working very closely with, with whoever is providing that communication. For access and functional need strategies, the opportunity is to shift the culture of emergency response to fully integrate diversity of needs and equitable outcomes. And this is to integrate AFM populations and evacuation and emergency response plans from the beginning and also getting their input in designing these plans and protocols. Another opportunity is again to create these standby fast teams uh, with adequate supplies and training. Also identify people with disabilities so that further assistance can be distributed as needed. There, there is a number of lists out there that they attempt to try to find uh, individuals who may need additional assistance in evacuation, but most of the time they are not up to date and they are not necessarily comprehensive. So thinking about different mechanisms and different lists that could designate baseline needs is something that has to happen in the next one to two months. Finally, create and verify MOUs with transportation providers for paratransit service. In some cases, this is easy because it's a single transit agency, but in some cases, paratransit is contracted out to a separate company. And sometimes they have MOUs with other jurisdictions. And so if there is a disaster that impacts multiple jurisdictions, they only have a set fleet of vehicles to be able to provide that service. And without enough vehicles, there's going to be a, a, a significant amount of issues in terms of safety uh, for individuals who need additional mobility. Speaking of multi-jurisdictional strategies, the opportunity here is to break down silos between agencies and jurisdictions, and also specifically to integrate public health into emergency operations. One, one key uh, strategy that was, was noted by the experts was that there needs to be a coordinated effort on COVID-19 requirements and directives between, um, between jurisdictions, such as a face mask requirement. And this is important because people are traveling between counties and sometimes between states to evacuate. And evacuees might not necessarily, might not know what the requirements are in different jurisdictions. So providing this messaging to the public is critical. Also, uh, a key strategy is building and strengthening relationships with other jurisdictions and agencies. This goes without saying, again, sounds super easy, sounds a lot easier to do, but uh, in, in reality, uh, it's much harder. The saying goes is that you don't want to be exchanging business cards during a disaster. You want to be exchanging business cards before a disaster. And way too often, the cards are exchanged during the disaster. For emergency management strategies, which does impact all the different ESFs and different agencies, is improved technological capabilities and also flexibility in planning departments or planning documents. One specific strategy that was mentioned by a number of experts was to continually update evacuation emergency plans in response to COVID-19 and other evolving threats. This, these plans need to be flexible and people need to be continuously trained on them. Uh, and so transportation agencies particularly can, can play a role in updating the evacuation plans as different protocols change. An opportunity also exists to rethink emergency operations centers, also known as EOC, for either social distancing or creating and maintaining a virtual EOC and pools. So thinking about leveraging this technology in a different way. Ensuring substantial and continual training for, for changing COVID-19 guidelines and requirements for both employees and volunteers will also be critical. Ensuring all employees can work from home and specifically still be able to provide their disaster functionality, especially those who are in the EOC and ensure employees are mentally healthy via benefits, mental health days, and morale boosting programs. This kind of, this was born out of the, uh, the issue that a lot of emergency management officials and staff are stre already stretched very, very thin as of right now. And I think we're all feeling it. We're all very stretched, very thin. And uh, we need to make sure that employees are ready to tackle a disaster when it happens. And finally, an another, uh, non-innovative one but still important is to hold regular meetings and exercises to reevaluate planning and preparedness measures. I also have a list of a couple other key strategies. These ones didn't necessarily couldn't be devoted to a specific slide so they're all uh, lumped together but they are still uh, were mentioned by a number of experts. 
for the public health is to devote specific staff to addressing COVID-19 needs that is apart from other emergencies and disasters. So separating those two out uh, because a single person can't do both at the same time. But there still needs to be some communication between those two individuals or groups of individuals. Ensure social distancing measures are maintained and encouraged is also a key strategy, of course, uh, that was mentioned by experts. Hospitals and nursing homes, the strategy is to review evacuation and PSPS event plans from tier hospitals and adapt plans as necessary to create a hospital strategy. And another seemingly easy one, but has not really been uh, the focus is even identifying the location and emergency needs of hospitals and nursing homes in disasters and specifically for COVID-19 and the unique aspect of evacuating those different areas, uh, especially if there's COVID positive uh, individuals. Finally, with PSPS events, uh, there is improving and explore communi uh, effective communication of outages, especially to vulnerable individuals, holding consistent meetings for wildfires and PSPS, PSPS events uh, to develop more robust plans. And finally, the plans need to be developed by all different types of agencies to ensure that there's alternative power sources and preparedness such as generators for transportation, sheltering, and medical. Of course, many of these PSPS event strategies also uh, carries over into hurricanes, uh, especially when there are major power outages. So that's it for the strategies from the expert interviews. And I want to just give a very brief overview of uh, the August 2020 California wildfires and what's been going on and what strategies perhaps may have been, uh, been used during this time. Uh, so the California wildfires, this might be slightly outdated because this information is changing so rapidly right now. Uh, but we have over 367 fires with over 125,000 people uh, ordered to evacuate. There are three huge complexes of fires that are specifically threatening urban areas, the LNU, the SCU, and the CZU lightning complex fires. Uh, two of them are now the second and third largest wildfires in California history. So these are massive, massive fires. Uh, the August complex and the river fire are also occurring in Northern California area. So what has been going on? Well, this thing, it, these wildfires have been concurrent with rolling blackouts and a heat wave, which is also producing poor air quality. And this smoke is increasing the vulnerability to COVID-19. So this really highlights the intersectionality of a number of different disasters that have compounding effects to each other. There's also minimal notice during the evacuation rapid fire spread, and also just confusion on orders. Who is being ordered to evacuate? Where do I go? What happens in a COVID-19 world? Do I go to a shelter or do I not? A lot of confusion uh, from uh, a, a number of different sources. There was also power loss in, in a, several locations that threatened emergency notifications. Of course, this is a broader issue uh, when thinking about PSPS events and the deliberate shutdown of power. And finally, officials did encourage a full evacuation despite COVID-19. They said, escape the wildfires first, and then second, think about COVID-19. Uh, but of course, some of that has to occur simultaneously, and that is something that uh, will probably need additional research. A lot of the changes have been made on the sheltering front, and there was considered use of college dorms, Airbnb, campgrounds, hotels, and motels. In some of these cases, they did come to fruition like campgrounds, hotels, and motels. Uh, there was also encouragement for people to stay with friends and family and just new sheltering protocols, many of which were actually ones that were mentioned by experts, such as health screenings, extra cleaning, isolation, PPE and uh, sanitizers at shelters for, vol uh, for volunteers, requiring masks in shelters and also social distancing, such as cots being spread out in individual tents. So the good news is, is that some of the strategies are being implemented, but uh, there's still a long way to go, uh, as we see with uh, the upcoming hur Hurricane Laura being making landfall soon. So next steps of this uh, research and also things to be thinking about for everyone on the call uh, is just unsolved challenges and research needs. Uh, and some of these were, uh, actually all these were addressed by the experts and these were the, the most uh, pertinent ones that were uh, gleaned and the ones that had the most uh, notes by experts and includes evacuation of AFN populations, the long-term fiscal impact on public transit, paratransit, and emergency response because of the economic recession from COVID-19 and reducing funding streams. Staffing, workforce, volunteer levels was a major concern from almost all experts on operating vehicles, running shelters, providing medical care, 
it was a lot of concern that workforce and volunteers would just not show up in a COVID-19 world. And without those staffing and without the volunteers, a lot of shelters couldn't run or uh, transit uh, buses couldn't be used. Uh, there was also concern still of lack of PPE and supplies for the workforce, continued poor multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency coordination, especially where people end up going in their evacuee destination. There was concerns about the ability of hospitals and nursing homes to evacuate, how to stockpile supplies. And finally, there was a lot of concerns about how, of coming up with mechanisms to share lessons learned and best practices efficiently across jurisdictions. Uh, the good news is that this uh, you know, webinar is a good first step for providing a mechanism to share lessons learned and for agencies to start thinking about these unresolved challenges and, and research needs. And then I just want to leave you with just one thought for the future. And I think there, uh, in all crises, there are opportunities. And my thought for the future is that during this time of COVID, uh, how can we rethink future evacuations, not in the age of COVID, to be more equitable, sustainable, and safe. And this really goes back to the critical evacuation challenges in making this uh, process an improved quality of life and safety uh, for individuals who, who have to evacuate. And with that, uh, this is just a little bit of information about me. Um, feel free to contact me uh, at my email. We'll, again, as I know, noted before, we'll be producing our policy brief in a couple weeks. If you would like access to that, I think you can post that in the chat. Uh, and say you would like it. Uh, you can also email me at stephen.wong at berkeley.edu. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand it back over um, to Katie uh, for the Q&A, and, &A, and uh, we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen, for this very important and timely research. Um, I wanted to maybe zoom out a little bit at first and talk about um, coordination of evacuation. So you've mentioned a number of interconnected actors, agencies, and different jurisdictions. Who is really responsible for coordinating and communicating evacuation orders? And what roles do the different levels of government play in evacuation? That is a fantastic question and one that I do not have an easy answer for. And I think that shows the complications when it comes to emergency response and disasters. Uh, the who is the one to issue evacuation orders and who are the people to actually facilitate the evacuation differs by state. Uh, and, uh, and so that presents a number of challenges in terms of understanding who's in charge. Uh, in the case of California, there are a number of different agencies that appear to be able to give evacuation orders, including firefighters, law enforcement, emergency managers. Uh, but there's still no clear responsibility on who actually owns evacuation plans. There's actually no mandate in California that requires any jurisdiction to have any evacuation plan. Uh, there are mandates for emergency response plans, but those are different because the evacuation plan is really focused on transportation, which uh, is kind of the idea of this work. Uh, and so there's also a saying in terms of the level of government that um, disasters begin and end at the local level which is true, but many times these disasters are regional in scope and even cross state borders and even are a more national type of disaster where FEMA might step in. There's currently not been a lot of uh, interaction with FEMA in terms of transportation response. There are a couple of teams there that are working on evacuations and transportation protocol, but in general, FEMA is the last one in and the first one out. And so oftentimes they are not specifically involved in the evacuation process. They could, however, provide more concrete national standards or even checklists uh, for all agencies to be considering when they are creating an evacuation plan, such as the, there's more streamlined uh, planning across states, across jurisdictions. Um, so the answer to the question is very complicated, but I think one, one thing that needs to come out of not just this work but many other evacuation work is that someone needs to own the plan and someone needs to be specifically in charge and responsible uh, we saw that in many times in the expert interviews that uh, agencies uh, and experts said well they're not really involved with evacuations or we're not really involved with evacuations so we're just going to leave it to someone else but then we still couldn't figure out who was actually in charge uh, and so that, that, that's the case for a lot of jurisdictions in the United States. Great, thank you for that. 
Um, let's dig in a little bit to the role of transit. So in thinking about evacuation, how can we balance evacuation on public transit um, now with things that we have to think about in the time of COVID, like physical distancing, um, and then also thinking about capacity and speed and congestion, all of these different considerations that transit providers are needing to think about. How do we, how do we think about balancing that and what does your research um, provide us with in that area? Yeah, so I think one clear thing is that we can't go to fully uh, high capacity transit vehicles if we're going to be evacuating uh, locales. So I think that's just the first step. So first, we may need more vehicles in order to have the same amount of capacity, which does mean more drivers. Um, so that presents its own set of problems. But one opportunity that could be useful is that large public transit buses are only really, it's, are specifically useful for hurricanes, particularly, and for really, really large mass evacuations of millions of people. For smaller evacuations of 5,000, 10,000, even 50,000 people, these large buses may not be the most the best mechanisms, particularly in the case of wildfires. So we might have to think about right-sizing vehicles. And this is a conversation that is being talked about in a number of different areas. I've been hearing it in, in transportation research circles in the last couple months, is the idea of right-sizing vehicles and creating more flexible and adaptive on-demand services, such as micro transit, uh, and also leveraging shared mobility, such as ride hailing or car sharing or pooling, to be able to provide this um, these, uh, the evacuation mechanism for individuals. Uh, obviously, that still comes with its own set of challenges. You still have to try to reduce the amount of capacity, wear masks inside of vehicles, for example. Uh, think about all the different guidelines to go through with that. And there has to be a protocol and a process for that, especially when you start working with other companies, such as Uber or Lyft or other types of micro transit providers like Via. Uh, in providing that service. So I think the, the, the future is looking at looking more at right side vehicles that can do more uh, point to point pickups that are a lot more efficient than large buses. The buses will still be necessary for really large scale evacuations, but for smaller ones, uh, it's the smaller transit vehicles that are really nimble. Great, thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about communication. So you talked about some of the strategies that agencies are using, um, different means of messaging and so forth. How do local agencies balance comprehensive communication with, with over communication? So how can agencies ensure that messages are heard given the fact that there's so many actors involved and maybe the coordination isn't always optimal? Yeah. having. I, I would say the first step to that is having a single person or single agency that is really in charge of the predominant messaging. And then that messaging gets blasted out to all the other agencies. And having that leader in a crisis is really critical, especially a one that is very trustworthy. Um, I've seen different models where you'll have a disaster and uh, by, the fire department will issue their own communication. The police will issue their own communication. Emergency management will. Transportation, such as a transit agency, might as well. And sometimes these messages are not at the, are not occurring at the same time, and also lack the same amount of information. Some have more information that, than others, and so this adds to the confusion of the evacuation process. And so communicating to the public beforehand on who is the person in charge, who, where do we get our alerts from, and having that single point be really critical. A lot of people look to really high trustworthy organizations. Fire departments are usually a, a good bet uh, in the case of wildfires, but may not be the case for other types of disasters. So uh, the recommendation here is that regional coordination and ensuring that there's multi-jurisdictional coordination and having most likely a regional agency uh, for some of the smaller events and maybe even a specific statewide agency that is in charge of running those communications uh, across uh, the, the different jurisdictions. Okay, and this is an, another question about coordination and maybe uh, evacuation logistics. So given the significance of an extreme hurricane such as Laura, which you mentioned earlier, um, that's occurring during COVID, are strategies being considered to more widely distribute evacuees even outside uh, the respective states being impacted in order to reduce density in the sheltering sites? Yeah, there has 
to my knowledge, there hasn't been too much on redistributing uh, evacuees. With hurricanes, people do travel to a pretty wide uh, number of locations. And we saw that even with Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, when people were also sent to Houston in the, uh, for sheltering. So that is a strategy, though, is to reduce the amount of people in a specific area. Also, uh, reduce people in a destination county that has a high COVID infection rate or has a significant jump in cases, for example. Uh, because as we saw from the other, or as I mentioned from the other research, uh, they did find that wherever that destination is, it's going to be uh, critical. The other aspect is that you don't want to be overloading um, counties or other areas that are already having a high number of hospitalization rates from COVID-19. Uh, because that does also mean less space for uh, evacuees who may also need medical attention as because you have a huge influx. And then, of course, just the amount of resources available. So in terms of what has been happening on the ground, I haven't heard that much about it. Um, I do know in the California wildfires that uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, tourists and other people visiting Santa Cruz are actually told to leave the city uh, because to free up hotel space and Airbnb space for fire evacuees. So there is also a process of trying to get people who are like tourists, for example, out of an area so that evacuees can be closer to their homes and closer to their communities. Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to dig in a little bit more to the, the topic of equity. Um, you spoke quite a bit about equity considerations and evacuation actions, um, specifically sheltering and so forth. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about considerations of social equity in working with communities on evacuation planning and communications kind of upfront and before the fact, um, maybe in the context of framing evacuation transportation as a right, as you've suggested. Yeah, so, you know, in, in all these strategies, the experts were very clear that preparedness and discussions have to happen beforehand. These can't be ad hoc strategies that are applied during the, the evacuation. And when it is ad hoc, it is usually vulnerable populations that are most uh, in crisis at that time and usually the ones left behind. And so interfacing with community groups, for example, and experts, uh, for example, uh, for uh, having disability experts in the room for the exercises, for the actual planning process is going to be critical. Also, in terms of community-based strategies, it is good to integrate the community into these plans. In many cases, communities know best. They, it, it, and they, they know what works for the community in terms of where people can go and what routes to take and who may need additional assistance, such as neighbors. And so discussions and exercises and training with them specifically is also very, very important. Uh, this neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor idea is something that is, can also be leveraged in providing transportation uh, and ensuring that people uh, have the ability to uh, evacuate. And for those who may not have a neighbor who is able to take them, that's where the transportation as a right comes into play, and that public transit agencies need to be interfacing with emergency management and these different types of community groups on what their needs are in a disaster. So this does require a heavy lift for public transit and transportation agencies. And this is somewhat new. Many public transit agencies are not necessarily involved in disasters. They, they may not even have a single person involved in disasters or evacuations. They may have someone who oversees emergency management, but they don't necessarily have someone who is on the ground working for evacuations. And so perhaps creating those types of positions or uh, adding tasks to uh, individuals who are focused on emergency management and preparedness at a trans transportation or transit agency will be important for uh, increasing social equity. Uh, and again, having those experts in the room and, in and disability advocates is also going to be uh, a critical, critical aspect. Great, thank you. And we're running up on time here, but I wanna ask one more question. You kind of hinted in your presentation that although you're focusing on California, a lot of the findings from this research are more broadly applicable. And we have a question about coordinating um, this information with agencies like APTA, FRA, CTA, RTA, yeah. Airlines, track, sort of the national orgs. Um, how, how do you foresee coordinating this with um, to, to help support equitable public safety programs at, in a broad, at a broader scale? 
Yeah, that's that's a tough question because I think there have been efforts in the past to try to do that. Uh, having a single clearinghouse definitely helps. Who that clearinghouse is on all this information is another question. Uh, it could be tra uh, the Transportation Research Board. Uh, it could be FEMA uh, to create a more federal and more stream, uh, more, I guess, common response across jurisdictions. But there, I, the federal argument may not be as strong, largely because there are a lot of unique local aspects. So. The one option could be in terms of querying is that FEMA, you know, creates these guidelines and, and houses all these guidelines. And then there are specific regional areas or regional clearing houses that are able to provide more specific guidance and, for example, technical assistance uh, for developing these plans and guidelines. So it's, it's not an, I think that's honestly a question that, that is across the board in many different transportation uh, areas and topics, not just you know, in uh, evacuations, think micromobility and the scooters and how to deal with, you know, scooters showing up on your street, street for example, and what that looks like. So I think uh, having that clearinghouse and an, a, a single initiative or several initiatives that are linked together could be a great opportunity in terms of sharing these lessons learned and communicating these strategies to agencies. And of course, uh, webinars like this also are very beneficial and just cr trying to create a, an ecosystem where people are meeting. Thank you, Stephen. And we have a number of questions we weren't able to get to, but I want folks to feel free to reach out to Eno and they can connect you with Stephen. So thank you, Stephen, and thanks to our listeners. Eno's next webinar on sustaining UAS, unmanned aircraft systems progress while pursuing a permanent regu regulatory framework will be held next Tuesday, September 1st. As always, don't forget to sign up for Eno Transportation Weekly for regular updates on Eno's work and other transportation policy matters. Thank you.